and thank you, Kathy, for inviting me to participate in your program today. And uh, in particular, to give me a chance to talk about a topic uh, that we've made a top priority during my seven years at NTIA. And I know many of you in this room and watching from around the world are familiar with multi-stakeholder processes through the work of ICANN and the IANA stewardship transition. Um, however, I'd like to spend a few minutes to go into detail as to why we see this as not just a tool for global technical internet issues, but also as a potential alternative to address a far broader set of policy issues. Clearly this model has a successful record of accomplishment when it comes to technical internet issues. And all of us have watched in awe over the past two years as the global internet community comprised of businesses and technical experts and public interest groups and governments has engaged in one of the most compelling demonstrations of a multi-stakeholder process ever undertaken through the work on the IANA stewardship transition. And given the intensive level of effort that went into developing that transition plan and building consensus for it from all parts of the ICANN community, it's no surprise that today we find all sectors of the community, businesses, civil society, technical experts, supporting the transition. And I wanna thank the Internet Society and Kathy Brown in particular for your steadfast support of the transition. I know you and other supporters want to see the United States follow through on its longstanding bipartisan commitment to complete the privatization of the domain name system. And as I told the Senate Judiciary Committee last week, we need to show our trust in the private sector and the work of technical experts from around the world, global businesses and civil society who have delivered a thoughtful consensus plan by supporting this long promised privatization. At NTIA, we have been inspired by the efforts of the IANA transition multi-stakeholder working groups, and we are putting our time and resources into adapting the multi-stakeholder process to address other issues, because we know it can help build trust in the digital ecosystem and can be an effective tool, not just to make progress on internet policy change challenges. The process has the ability to produce in a timely way meaningful guideposts for industry and consumers in this rapidly evolving technological environment. As we have thought about how to use the process more widely, we have focused on two key attributes we think are critical in the design of any multi-stakeholder approach. They are participation and consensus decision-making. Uh, let me start with participation. Internet policy issues draw a much larger range of stakeholders than traditional telecommunications issues. And one key benefit of a multi-stakeholder process is that it can include and engage all interested parties. And as I've mentioned, these parties can include industry, civil society, government, technical and academic experts, and even the general public. The internet is a diverse, multi-layered system that thrives only through the cooperation of many different parties. And solving or even meaningfully discussing policy issues in this space requires engaging these different parties and indeed, by encouraging the participation of all interested parties, multi-stakeholder processes can encourage broader and more creative problem solving. The second key attribute is consensus decision making. For a multi-stakeholder group to succeed, its members must know that they will be the ones to make the decision, not someone else, and that it must be a consensus decision. Some countries or organizations have run what they call multi-stakeholder processes that in reality are only consultations because the group is not empowered to make the final decision. But we have found that when groups know that they control the final decisions, they are more likely to put in the extra effort often needed to reach a true consensus. And usually reaching consensus requires making compromises, but the group has to feel that reaching a shared decision is the most important goal, commanding and requiring making those compromises. Otherwise, stakeholders who are simply satisfied with the status quo can be ultimately destructive to a multi-stakeholder model. Participants must also believe that the multi-stakeholder process has the legitimacy to reach a decision. They must have some trust in those convening the process and a sense that the participants are representative of the broader community. Often that legitimacy may come from a government or some other official entity that convenes the process. But that does not always have to be the case. The Internet Engineering Task Force, in fact, is an example of a successful multi-stakeholder body 
that has gained legitimacy organically over the years and did not require the blessing of government agency like NTIA. Instead, it gained its legitimacy by producing voluntary standards of the highest quality and through open, transparent, and inclusive processes. In the United States, the legitimacy of multi-stakeholder processes that we have convened has certainly been helped by our involvement and by their open and transparent manner. But government does not always need to be the legitimizing force. And so while it's a crucial factor in the success of multi-stakeholder processes, there may be different ways to obtain it. So let me tell you how we've been using the process in the United States. Keep in mind that my agency, NTIA, is not a regulator like our Federal Communications Commission. However, we have been able to make progress on issues of privacy, intellectual property, and cybersecurity by organizing and facilitating multi-stakeholder discussions on these issues. Like ICANN, our domestic processes are open to anyone who wishes to participate, and we have carefully circumscribed our role to act as a neutral convener and facilitator. We take extreme care not to ever substitute our judgment for that of the stakeholders. In the privacy area, we've convened industry, academics, and others to develop codes of conduct and best practices that implement the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights outlined in President Obama's blueprint on consumer data privacy. After more than a year of work, stakeholders reached consensus on a code of conduct to provide improved privacy notices for mobile devices. And just this past June, stakeholders wrapped up work on a set of best practices to help protect privacy related to the commercial use of facial recognition technology. Last year, the president directed NTIA to convene stakeholders to develop best practices on privacy, transparency, and accountability issues related to the commercial and private use of unmanned aircraft systems, better known as drones. And after several months of hard work, a diverse set of stakeholders, including privacy and consumer advocates, industry, news organizations, trade associations, announced in May that they had reached agreement on a best practices document. On the copyright front, NTIA collaborated with our sister agency, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, on a multi-stakeholder process to explore ways to improve the operation of the notice and takedown system for removing infringing content from the internet under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And after many meetings, stakeholders completed a helpful list of good, bad, and situational practices aimed at improving the processing of DMCA notices by both senders and recipients. And then on cybersecurity, stakeholders are working to finish principles and guidance for the disclosure of cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And next month, we'll be convening a new process to support better consumer understanding of the need for security upgrades in Internet of Things products. Now, we do not see the multi-stakeholder process as totally replacing the need for legislation and regulation. However, this tool can be an effective way to address emerging issues in the evolving technological landscape. It allows for nimble, flexible approaches that participants can agree upon and modify much faster than traditional regulatory or legislative models would allow. If we addressed all technological policy challenges with the typical Washington regulatory or legislative process, we might still be waiting for resolution. Worse, by the time laws or regulations were finalized, we would likely find that the problem they were intended to solve no longer exists or has evolved into a totally different challenge. But utilizing multi-stakeholder processes, we can minimize this likelihood of hamstringing technologists and users from creating the robust, evolving internet we enjoy today. The United States government, including our Congress, has long championed the multi-stakeholder approach as the preferred tool for dealing with internet policy issues. At NTIA, we will continue to trumpet the advantages of this approach wherever we can, both domestically and internationally. And I ask all of you who support the model to help educate others about it and to push back against the ignorance sometimes displayed by opponents or skeptics of the approach few of whom have ever actually participated in a process. We all want to protect internet freedom and promoting the multi-stakeholder model is central to that protection. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Are you able, am I good for sound? All right. 
So um, the next part of this is we're going to, I'm going to try to moderate um, a conversation with Assistant Secretary Strickling from all of our uh, questions from, from folks in our nodes and online. Um, and I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative, Larry, if that's all right, and start with um, one question. That, given that you've um, been working in this multi-stakeholder model for any number of years, and knowing that many of the Internet Society chapters around the world are trying to work with their governments, trying to advance this, this methodology, what would be your advice to Internet Society chapters in countries that are just trying to get this model off the ground? How can they work with their governments? What do you think would be helpful? Well, I think the first thing, or one of the first things, is to point to the successful examples of the model being utilized elsewhere in the world. Um, and while we've done some things recently here in the United States, there is a history and tradition of this model being used in other countries that I think provide good models to developing nations in particular. Um, much of what we do, in fact, is based on the CGI Brazil model from several years ago, um, which many people still hold up as kind of a paradigm of, of how to approach these things. And so I think finding examples in your own region where countries or institutions in a country have engaged in this is important in terms of being able to uh, go to a government and explain to them the benefits of this. Um, I think also it's important if it's going to be a multi-stakeholder process, you have to engage all of the different classes of stakeholders. And so, um, in, especially in developing countries, as industry uh, evolves and as they start to establish groups to represent their interests, as civil society develops in these, it's important to find ways to uh, create alliances between these various groups of stakeholders to build the, uh, the in effect, the grassroots, the bottoms up uh, support for engaging in these kinds of activities. So one of the questions that's in our um, our chat here says that doesn't the very diversity and multiplicity of stakeholders make these this kind of process very slow? Um, are there ways to streamline multi-stakeholder deliberation so that they can achieve decisions in internet time? <laughs> I, I think and believe strongly it has to be left to the participants. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give the example of the IANA stewardship transition work. Uh, when we announced that in March of 2014, I think a lot of people felt, oh, well, um, at that point in time, the contract ex was going to expire at the end of September 2015. Right. That would be plenty of time uh, for the community to develop the necessary plan. Um, but when it emerged in the spring of 2015 that the community would do well to take more time, um, we were quick to get out and, and talk to the leadership of the various working groups and suggest that they should really think about how much time they need and tell us, and we would make sure that the contract would be extended to give them the time that they needed. And that if, in fact, people were working against an arbitrary deadline of September 2015, they would not have ended up with a plan as good and robust and as totally accepted as the plan that they were able to develop with the extra time. So you can't force it, but I would push back against the idea that it's slow. Um, it's chaotic. There's no question about that. Um, it's, it's complicated. It requires a set of skills to participate in and to be a convener and facilitator of that are foreign to many people, particularly people who have been bred in the Washington uh, system of regulation and legislation. But when you look at the fact that here in Washington, we've been unable to update the Electronic Communications Privacy Act for decades um, on something as simple as to how old an email has to do to be to be protected from disclosure, um, it's hard to make the case that regulation and legislation operates much faster than a good multi-stakeholder process. Very good. Is there a way for me to see the nodes and see if we have questions in the nodes? Can I see the hands up? You'll take. You'll let me know. Okay, so I don't have to look for hands. Okay. Um, so another question that's in here. Oh, and my <laughs> my thing went to sleep. Um, is how can organizations like the Internet Society and other groups? Um, what can we do to convince governments and legislators to try to regulate the internet less and let the internet be autonomous and continue to just grow without this kind of heavy intervention? Well, it's the process of education that we've been talking about. 
Um, but in that sense, you've got a great record to point to, which is look at how the internet has grown and thrived and evolved in the environment in which it's operated. Um, and it's the, the message to uh, governments who want to regulate this ought to be, why mess with something that's working as well as this? Let's leave it with the stakeholders who have uh, created an environment that depends so much on the trust and cooperation of all of the actors. Um, don't interfere with that because you might actually disrupt the economic growth and innovation and job creation that's taken place. So the, the historic record is there. It's a question of being able to convince um, uh, policymakers who perhaps don't know as much about this as others of, of the importance of that. So I'm going to try something and see if I can turn to um, our friends in, let's see, in Mexico City, New York. New York. Okay. Mexico City here. Perfect. Uh, let's start with Mexico City and then I'm going to go to New York. Thank you, Sally. Larry, uh, pleased to say hello to you. This is Alejandro Pisanti, also in, on behalf of the uh, uh, ISOC Mexico uh, members and uh, other student participants here at the Universidad Iberoamericana, the Ibero-American University. Uh, I have a comment on Larry's statement about uh, multi-stakeholder organization. Uh, for internet decision making in each country. Uh, we here uh, are not fully in agreement with the CGI of Brazil model in the sense that uh, it becomes a target for capture uh, and a possible single point of failure if things go wrong. Uh, there are fears in Brazil right now with the government change that things could change uh, uh, unfavorably. And we believe in this case that if you already have a functioning system that is more multipolar, where, for example, spam issues are being discussed with ISPs and other participants, um, where rules for privacy are being discussed and elaborated together with the Data Protection Authority and the multi-stakeholder mechanism there, you have a multipolar, issue-oriented, heuristic, problem-solving approach that may be more robust in the long term. Larry, do you have an opinion about that? Well, I, it may be that what you're pointing out, Alejandro, is that um, the openness of diverse participation is a factor in this because I think you're, um, when you talk or look at CGI Brazil, I do think, if I remember right, that it's not a, a totally open organization in terms of inviting anybody to participate. There are seats that people hold. Um, and we certainly favor an approach that opens this up to anybody who wants to participate, and maybe that serves as something of a check on the capture issue that you've identified. Very good. Thank you, Alejandro. It's good to see you. Uh, I will turn now to our friends in uh, New York. This is Jolly McPhee. Can you hear me? Hello, Jolly. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, well, first I'd like to uh, thank Larry for his testimony last week uh, before the committee, and I do hope that Senator Cruz does not put him in jail. We follow the law, oh. <laughs> as I made clear to him many times last week. Um, and so uh, when it comes to the multi-stakeholder thing, the, the people that are in the industry have got financing from their companies, the people from government have financing, the people more so from civil society and the end users, you know, they don't have the financing. How can this be a level playing field? You're putting your finger on an extremely important point. Um, and I do think that the convening groups that are, are starting these processes have to think about that and focus on that in terms of how to make sure that, that we can give opportunities to people wherever they live or uh, whatever their economic means to be able to participate in these processes if they want to. So technology can help in that regard in terms of uh, of allowing people to participate without having to travel hundreds or thousands of miles to participate. And I think fundamentally there has to be a look given to financial assistance to ensure broad representation for these sorts of things. In our case, with the, with the processes that we've managed, we've tried to be sensitive to geographic dispersion in terms of finding other places than Washington, D.C. to convene people. Um, we're not in a position to be able to provide travel assistance to folks, but we have uh, looked into how to be able to use technology so that 
people can watch our sessions. They're all streamed on the internet. They can participate remotely from their um, home with or, or office, regardless of what city they're in. And so that is the thing that people have to pay attention to, because it comes back to this notion that you want the widest possible participation as a way to get the best ideas on the table and to reach the most creative outcomes. And you have to recognize that not everyone has an equal opportunity to participate and take steps to correct that. And just to jump in on that, I think that's one of the reasons Internet Society is using a tool like this meeting to try to figure out how can we make and use this technology uh, of the internet to make internet decisions can we can we do better than flying ourselves all over the globe all the time and 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 feeling like we're in the airport and or airline industry rather than the internet industry um, i also would say something that we've talked a lot about at the internet society is you know, in, in countries like the United States and maybe more developed countries, you have a very developed civil society, but we really have to make sure that civil society voices, particularly from developing countries, have a way to participate in these processes. And that's uh, something that starts even before the process itself, that, that these groups exist and that they're active and that they have um, a voice in their, in their local communities. Um, so going online, um, there is a question here about um, uh, the IANA transition, uh, no surprise. But the question is, what would be the effect of the U.S. blocking the transition now on the credibility of multi-stakeholder governance? Well, um, well first off, we're, we're referring to Congress blocking right. the transition, <laughs> not the U.S. government. We are totally want to proceed with Absolutely. this, as we've announced. Um, uh, I, I'm quite concerned about the ramifications for um, our credibility with the rest of the world if Congress were to block this transition. It's uh, um, there, There's a fundamental disagreement about how to protect internet freedom between people who have worked and understand the internet and some folks on Capitol Hill who think they've got a, a different understanding of this. Um, and you know, we're, we, I guess we will know by September 30th which view is going to prevail. And I am quite concerned about uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, Congress blocking this transition, particularly since it's not based on the facts. Um, I think the hearing last mm -hmm. week demonstrated that a lot of the opposition is ill-informed um, and doesn't truly understand what's at stake here. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll be watching this process very carefully, um, and, and certainly our view at, at the administration is this, the transition should be allowed to proceed as promised. And again, it's nothing that was promised just by us two years ago. People like to say that this was a radical proposal <laughs> that we generated in 2014, but it, it ignores the fact that this was part of the original plan going back to 1997 and 98. It has been a shared goal of Republican and Democratic administration since that time, um, and we're really at a point where it ought to be allowed to complete. Well, I can say at the Internet Society, we couldn't agree more with that. So um, we are certainly hopeful that that, that is the case. Um, I have a question, I think, from Olga in Buenos Aires. Hello, Olga. I think we're unmuting you here. Hello. Can oh. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, this is our note here in Buenos Aires. Uh, thank you everyone for organizing this and thank you Larry for your comments. Um, I would like to add a comment from from ISO perspective and from ISO chapter perspective is that the challenge for the multi-stakeholder model now is uh, to include all the stakeholders but the challenge is to include new layers of stakeholders. What I mean with this is, for example, uh, we have private sector, but we have to include small and medium enterprises as well. And we have universities, but we have to include the universities which are far away from big cities or in small universities and uh, other levels of government, not only the national government, but also allow other governmental areas like municipalities or provinces to get involved in these problems. So we see the chapters, ISO chapters, the way to engage these local communities and these local new layers of stakeholders. This is the next challenge and we all agree and we had a fantastic conversation this morning about the different things that we can do all together and we had good dialogue about 
uh, creating uh, content and, and, and trust and, and build trust among uh, stakeholders. But we need to go a little bit further. And we think that internet society can make the difference in this regard. Thank you. Good comment. There I am. Thank you, Olga, for that. Um, I would also add to that, I think um, certainly society chapters, as well as the, the work that they do to support the local and regional IGFs in their countries is a way to bring stakeholders into this conversation that might not otherwise participate. And again, bringing things locally uh, helps, helps possibly ensure that we're not always flying to, to far-flung places to have these conversations, and it, and it makes the process more accessible to more people. I understand that we have a question or a follow-up comment in New York. I'm, I'm still talking about the money, and uh, now I'd like to get on to the IGF, and so the, you know, the financing of the IGF and whether the IGF should become kind of more independent of the UN and how it can progress. So I know it wasn't a question, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, Thank you. Uh, from the perspective of the United States, we support the Internet Governance Forum by the government and a deliberation of the more specific issues that you've raised. Um, but I think it's important to maintain and preserve the IGF going forward. We think it performs a very important role that the, the, the discussions that are held every year are important. We support the idea of finding ways that those discussions can continue on intersectionally. And I know there's been a lot of thought given to that. Um, over the last many months. Um, but on your specifics about financing and independence, uh, uh, we don't have a, a view on that at this point in time. And I'm going to ask, I have Marilyn Cage. She might have a view on that topic as well. Thank you. I do. <laughs> Give her a mic, please. She has a mic. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Marilyn Kate. I'm just handing out a little chart that I was going to put in the back of the room. I'll post it um, to others. It is the timeline of the national and regional IGF. So I'm going to wear my hat of being a board member of the Internet Governance Forum Support Association, which ISOC contributes to and supports. And in fact, Raul, who I saw in uh, Argentina, is the chair. Um, I'm also a contributor, a small contributor, as ISOC is, and others are, to the UN Trust Fund, as is the US government. I wanted to talk about, Sally, I just wanted to open the dialogue about how uh, significant and important the contribution of the ISOC chapters are globally to ensuring that we have 67 national and regional IGFs People need to understand that we had none when we walked out of um, Tunis, and we had none when we walked out of Athens. We're now at 67. I've been um, invited by the MAG chair to be the substantive coordinator. We have a commitment to double the number. We're only going to do that if the ISOC chapters continue to be the catalyst that they are right now. So I'm individually recognizing many of you from the chapters and noting that um, ISOC's role in this is really critical. And I think the role model that the US government provides by providing funding to the UN Trust Fund is also helping to make sure that although governments primarily contribute to the Trust Fund, there's businesses, the technical community contributes. We now have the IGF Support Association that you as an individual can join for $25. You can guide what we fund from the IGF SA, and you can help to make sure that there's more multi-stakeholder participation. So let me tee that up, and if you want a copy of my mystical magical chart, I'll just say <laughs> I got that from the IGF Secretariat and happy to share it. Thank you very much, um, Marilyn. Thank you. Certainly, I think from Internet Society's uh, perspective, we share that um, commitment to the local and regional IGFs and, and um, believe that really many of these decisions 
are taken locally, right? And this is the internet and the, and the decisions that need to be made are taken by local communities, trying to build out infrastructure, trying to interconnect networks, trying to figure out how to bring content home and bring it, you know, make it available locally or deploy local content. These are things that are done within local communities. So the more we can inspire that conversation among the different stakeholders, we think the more progress can be made on the technical front, on the policy front, et cetera. Um, so we have a few more questions that, um, Larry, these maybe go off in a little bit of a different direction. I hope you'll, you'll bear with us here. Um, there's one question here that says, what can be done to uh, avoid uh, countries following um, this, this trend, that, or maybe not a trend, but um, national intranets, the sphere of fragmentation along national borders? Um, how can we push back on that? What What's the way to keep that from happening? <laughs> Million dollar question. Well, I, I don't know that there's a particular single solution to this. Um, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of, I think, economic pressure and economic incentive for a um, an internet that, you know, the single route that connects everybody everywhere. I think that minimizes the friction for businesses that are trying to do um, you know, make money over the internet. It minimizes the friction for people who want to communicate and share ideas over the internet. Um, we know there are individual countries who are threatened by the idea of a totally free and open internet within their own borders, and they take steps to uh, restrict content that their own citizens can see. Um, I think long term, the only way to overcome that, and hopefully the multi-stakeholder model provides some help in that, is that by building up the institutions in some of these countries among their civil society, among their business community, that they just won't accept that sort of uh, um, restriction going forward. It's long-term probably the only solution to this, um, which is why I think it's important to keep pressing for the engagement involvement of stakeholders wherever they live and participating in these processes. And then over time, those institutions perhaps can develop in some of these countries and lead to the changes there. Um, but I do think the good news is that ec the economic incentives for people who are interested in, in get seeing the economic benefits of the internet economy, uh, that that trends toward and leans toward openness. So mm -hmm. we've got that going for us. But um, to offset some of the fears that authoritarian countries have about it, um, that's going to be a long-term effort. So I'm going to turn lastly to our uh, friends in Ottawa to see if anyone at that node has any comments or questions before we wrap up. Uh, Ottawa's on mute. Is there a way to unmute Ottawa? Sorry, I didn't mean to surprise everyone. There we go. So I'm going to turn lastly to our uh, friends in Ottawa to see if anyone of that node has any comments or questions before we wrap up. We uh, don't have any questions or comments, but uh, that they needed to bleep or what? <laughs> can you hear us? Now we can hear you. Sorry, I didn't mean to surprise everyone. Can you hear us? Yes. There we go. You can hear so All right, very good. The technology works most of the time. Um, well, I think at that point, we're going to wrap this up. Larry, I don't know. I don't have any questions or comments, but I think they needed to believe for a Sorry, I keep looking at Paul, but it's not him, right? All right. It's just be thin. Do you have any concluding Just, remarks uh, before we go? Thank you for inviting me over. I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Um, these kinds of regional and international efforts to link people together. I commend the Internet Society for being kind of the 
you're able to continue it on and solve all your technological <laughs> issues uh, by the time you tee this up again next year. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Larry. We really appreciate you taking time. And I think we take a five minute, 10 minute break and then we will reconvene.